This is a compilation video of quickies that were once uploaded to my main channel. I moved them off there since they were cluttering the place up between my main videos. While I have divided each of them up based on anime season, there may be some things from other anime seasons mixed in there as I may have watched things that were from a prior season during that one. You will find timestamps for each anime talked about in each of these compilations in the description. Thank you! Anime finished this year number one, Dr. Stone season two, Stone Wars. 7 out of 10, last season an 8 out of 10. Overall, another really solid season. My only major complaints were that everything wrapped up a bit too easily in the end and that some of the side characters are just a little too quirky. On the plus side, this did get my ass in gear to finally read the whole manga, which I have now finished. And while I may not like some of the directions that it went in, the characters remain fun enough that I'll likely watch any seasons of the anime that follow. Anime finished this year number 2, My Hero Academia Season 5, 6 out of 10, with last season being a 7 out of 10, and prior to that, 8 out of 10. So it's my understanding that this season was reshuffled some from the manga, and hearing that isn't surprising to me at all. I looked into it, and it seems a lot of what was done was to move the most interesting content from this portion of the series to the end of the season, which isn't a bad idea on paper, but I don't think it really worked out in their favor here. The entire middle of the season felt like it was kind of spinning its wheels, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, things are happening, but the entire thing felt like quite a long stretch of pe the The entire middle of the thing felt quite slow instead of uh, being peaks and valleys over the course of the entire season. And that's not even getting into the movie promo episode shoved into the middle of it. I've always had a little bit of a problem with the way that My Hero Academia tends to end its seasons on arcs of their slower cooldown pieces. I understand the appeal for some, but I tend to prefer when a season of a show ends with a bit more of a bang. This season did just that by placing some of the most interesting content in the last seven or so episodes, but it came at the cost of the rest of the season since it fin didn't feel like it was ramping up, more like, ah yeah, here's the exciting stuff now. I think part of the problem is that most of the season is based a lot in little short arcs that are setting up the next really big beefy one that will likely take up all of season six. Unfortunately, it means this season ends up just feeling like a big stretch of setup and little else at times. Sure, we get some character development, but even that's a bit of a slog at times because of the biggest problem of this season. I feel like the show doesn't trust my intellect anymore. I'm really starting to get tired of how much the show feels the need to have flashbacks to something that happened just a few episodes ago. Showing me something that happened back in season 2 again as a refresher, I can understand that, but a conversation from just last episode, I don't really need. Perhaps this is just a consequence of me binge-watching this season after it was complete, but I've done that every year and it felt particularly bad and time-filler this season. I understand the show's not entirely aimed at my age demographic, but it feels like it's not trusting its audience to remember even the basics at some point here. On the other hand, the action is still well done and the, animation's on point as and the animation is as on point as it's ever been. I've never had Bones disappoint me in that respect. I suppose I should still say I am looking forward to next season and I do still enjoy the show, but the cracks showed in this season more than they have in others. Anime finished this year number 3, Bofuri. I don't want to get hurt so I'll max out my defense. 5 out of 10. This is one of those shows that while I enjoyed watching it at first, the longer it went on, the less interested I became. The concept of a somewhat clueless newbie gamer accidentally breaking the game by stumbling her way into powerful skill combos is cute and fun but there's only so long that one joke can last. Unfortunately, I just wasn't invested in anything surrounding Maple as none of it really grabbed me. However, it was fun at first and as a bit of a silly turn your brain off show, there's nothing wrong with it. I know a second season is confirmed or running or something like that right now, but I don't think I'll be watching it. I was pretty satisfied with just this one. I think it's best served to the watcher as a play it in the background while doing something else kind of show. Anime finished this year number 4, Kageki Shoujo, 9 out of 10. It hurts me knowing that this show and manga didn't get as many eyes as it should have, as that means I'm not likely to get a second season, more of a read the manga for the full story kind of a deal. It's criminal that nobody told me about this one and I had to find out about it on my own. It hurts my theater kid heart. This is really one of the underrated gems of last year. While the setup of a fictional school and theater company, the entire thing feels really down to earth despite that. We actually see some of the intense work that it takes these girls to go into this type of theater troupe that they're busting their asses for. Not only that, it handles the rougher topics that it approaches in a very even-handed way as well. 
some of these girls have some very real trauma and it's treated with the respect it deserves with more gritty detail than I would expect from a show that's this brightly colored and otherwise cheerful looking. It's a bit of a punch to the gut when it comes up, but in just the way that it should be when depicting these subjects. I also appreciate that none of the girls have some sort of otherworldly type of gift that makes them excel and steal the show from the rest. The girl who has years of experience in singing and dance struggles with emoting. The girl who can learn lines very quickly and mimic the actor's performances to a T needs to learn to put herself into the role instead of just copying others. The girl with the best singing voice is soft-spoken enough that acting becomes a struggle. So many of them have little bits of imposter syndrome and no gift that any of them has lacks a drawback that needs to be overcome. Anyway, I highly recommend this one and I have in fact been picking up that manga and it is absolutely delightful. I fear the reason that people miss this is because they mixed it up with Review Starlight. Anime finished this year number 5, Kaguya-sama, Love is War, Season 1. 10 out of 10. This is one of those ones that I always heard seller things about and I never got around to watching, which is odd considering romance is one of my favorite anime and manga genres. However, it was well worth the wait. I went in for pure comedy and came out with even more. There are points where it's shockingly heartfelt and really got to me. In particular, episodes 11 and 12 are the really the standouts, and it's already got the series up there with some of my favorites. I really love how over the top this show makes everything, and I am definitely looking forward to season seeing more. However, I am torn. Season 3 has just started, and I am caught up given that these TikToks that you're getting are actually a bit of a backlog, covering everything I've watched up to this point. Um, and so I am caught up, but the English dub is so fantastic that I am nearly willing to wait for it in this case. The narrator in the dub is absolutely stellar. Anime finished with series number 6, Kakiyosama Love is War Season 2. 10 out of 10, last season being a 10 out of 10 as well. Just as funny as the first, and I can't help loving this series, the comedy was just as on point, and this is one where you're really missing out if you're not watching the dub since it is fabulous. I think it was the right choice to introduce more running plot lines, characters, and straight up romance and drama elements in the second season. As much as I do love the starting premise of the series, there's only so long you can do something like that before you'll start getting repetitive or frustrating your audience. I can see how some people would want the series to stick to pure gags, but as someone who likes a good romance, I love the direction it's been moving in. From what I can tell from online discussion, these elements are only going to get more and more woven into the series, and I'm grateful for that. Eagerly awaiting the next season, and I've started reading the manga in the meantime. Anime finished this year number 7, Odd Taxi, 10 out of 10. At first, I thought this show was literally just going to be about the strange things that Odakawa encounters as a taxi driver. The interesting visuals and naturalistic dialogue were going to be what carried it for me. However, even from the start, there were some oddly darker elements dancing around the fringes of the episodes that I knew would hold my interest. Little did I know that I would be getting not only an investing drama and thriller, but a full character study. To say any more would spoil this beautifully intertwining story and the twists of this show, so I dare not. But let's be clear here. You know a show is good when it has you by the throat, when it can suddenly spend an entire episode on the backstory of a character we have never even met and still have me glued to the screen the whole way through. Anime finished this year number 8, Horimiya, 5 out of 10. Yeah, I don't know what happened here. From the start, it seemed pretty cute. Hell, I was even happy that it was a romance that I didn't have to wait until the end to see the main pair get together. However, it's unfortunate that it fumbled things so hard. Doesn't feel like there's any real stakes here. Don't get me wrong, I don't mind something that's light and slice of life. I can get behind a good everyone's in love with the wrong person romance plot. But that's the key part. It has to be good. There are just too many characters here, and I don't end up liking many of them. Miyamura was primed to be my favorite from the start, but the show just sort of feels like it forgets about him. The way his design and backstory is set up, it feels like we're in for a series-long arc about him coming out of his shell, learning to be around other people, and overcoming his depressive state. But none of that happens. 
or rather it happens too quickly. He starts dating Hori and then all of a sudden it's just all better, I guess. He cuts, it, he cuts his hair and it never really comes up again until the last episode. And Hori, ugh, I liked her at first, but the second she starts dating Miyamura, she tanks hard. This guy goes above and beyond for her, never pushes too hard, is sweet as can be in every way, and she just kind of treats him like shit. She's overly jealous, demanding, and pushes him to play along with this weird kink she's got. It's just not fun to watch. It's like the show didn't know what to do with them once they were together. Then every other character is either bland or outright awful. The fact that we got confirmation that Yuki knows she's being completely awful but won't do anything to be better and it never comes up again is infuriating. And worse, she's painted as sympathetic for this. I nearly dropped this one. I only finished it because I had four episodes left and was just kind of passively watching them while doing something else. It's a shame. I heard such good things, but the bad parts just really got on my nerves and the good parts I had seen done better elsewhere. I feel like I'm just about one of the only people that didn't like this show. Anime finished this year number 9, Ascendance of a Bookworm Season 1, 8 out of 10. I had wanted to watch this one back when it was coming out, but after looking into it, decided that I wanted to actually read the light novels before doing so. However, after reading the first two arcs, I was ready to dive in. Isekai is one of the genres that I used to really love, but has lost me over the years with both the way that it's become so oversaturated and how it keeps doing everything it can to appeal to male audiences to an extremely obvious degree. For me, one of them focused on a female character, on her relationships, and on her more down-to-earth struggles was an absolute godsend. It stands out in the best of ways. As someone who spent a lot of time reading, I just get this series and I am absolutely loving it. The thing that holds this one back, though, is that the production values on it aren't stellar. It looks fine, but it's not the prettiest girl at the party, you know? Anime finished this year number 10, Ascendance of a Bookworm Season 2, 8 out of 10. This season's really just more of the same, so I don't have much to add, but that's not a bad thing. It brings a whole lot of new elements into play for mine to be put up against, and it's still one of the few isekai that I've enjoyed lately. I'm glad to have con gotten caught up just in time to watch season 3 as it airs, even if I know generally where the story is going to be going from the books. Anime finished this year number 11, My Dress Up Darling, 7 out of 10. While I really love this one, I cannot in good conscience give it a score any higher due to the excessive amounts of fan service. Now, I'm not even one that thinks that all fan service is inherently bad. I think it can be used well and can be used as a way to progress plot and character. But it has to be done carefully, and that wasn't the case here, as it was often just a distraction, which was to the detriment of the series, in my opinion. I understand that for some people it's going to be too much, and I completely respect that. I've dropped series myself for having too much fan service before. However, the other elements of this series that I loved were enough for me to push past those rougher moments or even just pop forward 30 seconds in the video to get past it. I suppose I can at least be glad that none of the fan service was laden with any essay undertones. Though I was pleased to see that the beautiful animation was not reserved purely for those scenes. Oftentimes there's such care put into the little movements that a character makes or something innocent done with their hands. There's a lot of appreciation for the act of creation in this series, which is why I'm a little disappointed that the look into the effort it takes to make these costumes started falling off at the halfway point and never really came back. I would have loved to see more of Gojo working on things as we kept going. It's also disappointing to me that the way this series is produced has led all the conversation to have to center on the fan service elements rather than the relationship between Marin and Gojo since their chemistry is really delightful. I love me a pair of dumbasses in love. I also adore the messaging at the core about unabashedly loving what you love and not letting people make you feel bad about it. I love the passion that is in these characters. Anime finished this year number 12, Demon Slayer, The Entertainment District Arc. 8 out of 10, prior seasons a 9 out of 10. Demon Slayer is one of those series that's always delivered great baseline of quality, and Ufotable's animation has only served to enhance it into one of the best shonen action anime series of the modern era. Trust me, I adore this series, and Tanjiro is an excellent example of an empathetic protagonist. He's a sweet, good boy, and I love him dearly. 
However, there were a few elements of this season slash arc that just didn't work for me like the prior ones have. To start with, the handling of female characters was worse, and there was a kind of out of nowhere upswing in the sexualization of them, which caught me off guard. Now, I know a lot of people are rationalizing this as because it takes place in the entertainment district, but it's not all the background characters and workers that I'm talking about. You know, the ones that would make sense to be sexualized in this setting. Uzui's wives were the most obvious case of this, which went hand in hand with how they weren't very developed compared to the other characters. Additionally, I really didn't need that weird shot that lingered on Nezuko's breasts when she was hulking out. I understand that her clothing doesn't change size with her, but there's no need to focus so much on it. You have no idea how disappointed I was when we spent half the season building up Daki as a threat, only for her to be suddenly superseded by a male character. While I understand what the story was going for in creating a dark foil to Tanjiro and Nezuko's story, and I respect the attempt, it didn't really work because of one key factor. Nezuko can't speak. It's hard to draw parallels when the characters I'm meant to parallel aren't on a similar level. And I don't mean that on terms of power, but on capability of communication. Don't get me wrong, I love Nezuko and I think she's super adorable, but she's not a super well-constructed character a lot of the time. She's often more of a plot device, despite having cute moments of personality. Friendly reminder, physically powerful does not equal good or well-written. All that being said, I still really love this show. It's just that these elements were what held it back this season compared to others is all, and it's where my mind was at when I finished the season up. The other thing on my mind was the animation, but there's only so many times I can say that it's absolutely gorgeous before you'll get sick of that. Anime finish this year, number 13, Ranking of Kings, 8 out of 10. If we were just talking about the front half of the series, it would very much have been a perfect 10 for me. It was one of the stories I just love. It's sweet and kind, like my precious boy Boji, but without straying away from the darker elements that are part of the world it's constructed. The characters are amazing, and I was shocked at how easily the show was able to get me to care about the ones I was certain I was going to despise through the whole run. Hilling is easily one of my favorites, but Dida had a beautiful turnaround that I wasn't expecting to see. The problem is that the series started losing me in the second half. There was just some messiness overall, and the story for that section wasn't quite as strong. While I very much understand that the primary theme of the story is forgiveness, there were a few points where I thought the characters changed their minds on something just a touch too quickly for my tastes. Additionally, everything to do with Dida and Miranjo in the last two episodes is a big, big nope for me. I could go into more depth on that if people are interested, but let's just say I'm not okay with the current trajectory and there would need to be some big changes in a potential season two for me to approve. However, I think the series did end with what's most important to it, the relationship between Boji and Kage, my sweet darling boys who I only want good things for. And that's to say nothing of the animation that just blew me away at times. I know that not everyone's going to be into this somewhat simplified style, but I absolutely adored it. It moves very fluidly, and it meant that they were really able to pull things out when the moment called for it without the characters looking weird, because they already had some swish and stretch to them. I do want to see a second season, but from what I understand, that might be a few years off, as this covered the majority of the currently available manga. However, I don't think this could have been two seasons, as there was really no stopping point that would have felt satisfying anywhere in the middle of it. Anime finished this year number 14, Jujutsu Kaisen, 7 out of 10. Oh boy, I'm sure some people aren't going to like that score I just gave there. Sorry, but I just don't think I jived too strongly with this one, or maybe it's one of those series that's been overhyped. It seems these days that every action battle series that has stellar animation ends up kind of getting treated as some sort of second coming. Don't get me wrong, I think the show was excellently animated, and just getting to see it in motion was a sight to behold. I was grateful for that. However, I don't think the show is as groundbreaking and subversive as some people seem to think it is. It's doing a lot of the same beats that we would expect out of a shonen jump battle manga, after all. Granted, it's doing most of those quite well, but it's not something that was surprising or shocking to me in any way. Perhaps the biggest plot hook that we have is that our main character and a villain are sharing the same body. That's novel for sure, but it's not like that alone can sustain a series. 
though I admit I'm grateful that it wasn't just used as a solution to all our problems all the time either. I think it hit that right sweet spot of being a relevant plot detail, but not coming up quite every episode. I think part of my problem is that this was such a long season and I still feel like I haven't gotten to the main plot yet, you know? Like, there is some plot happening, yeah, but I don't feel like I have the main plot just yet. For example, I feel the main plot of Bleach kicks in with the Soul Society arc, and that happens in episode 17 of the first season of that series. I think part of the problem with Jujutsu Kaisen in this regard is that we got this big attack on the school, but during the event itself, it felt kind of disconnected, and the purpose of it was explained to us after the fact. It's my understanding that the next season will cover what some people claim is one of the best arcs, so perhaps that's when I'll feel things kick in if I end up watching it. There's just something about this show that makes it feel like everything has been in the setup phase this whole time, despite how fast-paced it could sometimes be. I think my other major issue is that I just don't vibe with the power system of this show. I think a lot of it is poorly explained sometimes, and that could be a symptom of notes from the manga being missed in the adaptation, I admit that. But for me, it just feels rather slapdash a lot of the time. There's good ideas there, but at this point, none of it feels really fleshed out and utilized. It doesn't happen that it feels like there's a bit of power creep happening here, even at this early stage of the series. All that said, I don't hate the series or anything, I just think it's doing some things well and some poorly with absolutely wild animation that's kind of plastering over some of the flaws for people. I do think it's a bit overhyped though, and not as deep as some people seem to think it is. Anime finished this year number 15, Violet Evergarden, 10 out of 10. Well, between me falling head over heels for this show and the fact that Vivi, Fluoride Eyes Song, was my favorite anime of the year last year, I'm discovering that I have a new favorite genre. Stoic young girl learns to feel while I get my heart ripped out and stomped on every other episode. Violet Evergarden is a show that is simply a treasure, and you have no idea how grateful I was to basically get a bonus episode with the TV special, which I'm also including in this ranking. I feel like it's so rare that we get a series that's all about love without it being a romance. Sure, there are some light elements of that in an episode or two here, but this is really about so many different forms of love that make up life, exploring each of them in their own way. The way that episodes 7 and 10 just threw me on the ground and mercilessly beat me with my own feelings was just about the kind of cry I needed. As someone who's lost a close family member very suddenly before, and someone who's also had a family member get the chance to write out a batch of last letters to family, there are some aspects of this show that just hit really hard. If there was a single complaint that I could have, it's that I would have taken one less episode of war-related things in exchange for one more episode where Violet just goes somewhere and writes a letter for someone. While the war episodes and the politics of the world are interesting, those are not the things that are going to stand out in my memory the most. However, I can see the need for them to be included in order to round this story out. I also appreciate that Violet's emotional journey was always at the center of this show. Even when the events happening in an episode were not about her, there was a connection to her, and it's in some way furthered her growth, something that was so, so apparent by the scene in episode 10 when she was back in the office. And my... God, this show is beautiful too. I have never watched a Kyoto animation show that has disappointed me with how it looked, but this was just absolutely next level at times. When a shot lingered on something, it was lingering on some of the most beautiful imagery in anime. And I swear that I'm not going to be able to listen to certain musical tracks from this show without getting hit with some pretty deep feelings. This has easily become one of my favorites and might end up being show of the year for me, even though the show itself is a few years old at this point. I'm excited that there are still two more movies I get to watch in order to get some more content with these characters, and I think this might be a show that I end up coming back to for a rewatch fairly soon. There are a handful of shows that I consider yearly rewatch shows, and I think this might get added to that rotation. Anime finished this year number 16, Haikyuu to the top, also known as season 4. 7 out of 10, prior seasons being an 8 out of 10. Ah uh, yes, the beautiful boys do volleyball anime. 
I binged the whole rest of this series last year with my roommate, and the only reason we hadn't watched the fourth season is that until the Blu-rays came out, the dub wasn't available anywhere, and we had gotten used to watching the dub after binging it that way. However, I've now binged the entire season over the course of two days, so what's the verdict? Well, Haikyuu has always had some solid consistency as a show, and this was the first time that I felt like that faltered. I'm not hugely interested in most general sports anime, I'll admit, but I do like volleyball as a sport, and I think it can be exciting to watch. Haikyuu has always been great about bringing that excitement and infusing it with some real heart and fun characters, enough so that I was able to overlook some of the elements that strike me as being cheesy. It's a solidly fun time. I wouldn't call the story or characters groundbreaking or anything, but they were fun, and that's about all you needed, really, just doing the best of this genre. What had always really pushed Haikyuu to the forefront of sports anime for me was the animation, and that's where this season faltered compared to the others. Granted, I know the second portion of the season was impacted by COVID ramping up as the first portion was airing, but when folks are watching this years down the line, they're not going to think about that or look that up, so I'm kind of trying to judge based off that, off having this season dropped in the middle of your multiple season binge. In that case, there was clearly a shift in the animation, even from the first part, that left a bit of a sour impression. There were points where the animation would really get pulled out during this show, and while there were still moments like that here, it felt like there were fewer of them. Uh, panning on still shots and moments where nothing is moving with a mouth also felt like they were way more frequent than before. Now, normally I'm willing to forgive some of that as it's just kind of the nature of the beast. You cut back where you can in order to put extra effort where it's important and all that. However, it's just one of those things that seemed to stand out a lot more to me this season. Like I said, I watched this with my roommate who isn't as into anime as I am and even she noticed it and pointed it out to me. And she told me, I feel like I'm seeing a lot of just that spinning ball on a background this season. The fact that I only knocked my score down by a single point should make it clear that this didn't ruin the season for me, as there were still other elements that were great. However, I was a little disappointed in this after the peak that was season 3. Anime finished this year number 17, Mob Psycho 100, 8 out of 10. Ah uh, yes, yet another one that I had always heard good things about but never got around to watching because I just didn't have time to watch a lot of anime when it was coming out. I admit there are a lot of series that I am still catching up on to this day. Either way, this was one that while it appealed to me, I wasn't sure if it was going to be something that I ended up watching just a few episodes and that was enough for me to be satisfied, or if I was going to end up watching the whole thing rather quickly. In this case, it ended up being somewhere in the middle because I wasn't binging this show, but I did watch it over the course of just a few days. What's most shocking to me is that despite people always talking about this show, I never heard much about what I now consider to be some of the more notable elements of it. I'd heard a lot about the whole gag about Mob joining the Body Improvement Club, which is one of the best moments in the beginning of the series, don't get me wrong. And I heard a lot about how stellar the animation is, and that's most certainly true. The number of different techniques that were used in order to pull this one off is simply fascinating. I think it was completely the right choice to stick to the simple art style from the original manga while also smoothing out a few of the rougher edges. Keeping things simple meant that they could warp the characters as needed with them still being recognizable, and I think it's part of the reason that we have some of those moments where the characters just move really fluidly. While some might not see the appeal and the look of the series, I find it frankly beautiful at times. However, it stands out to me that for all I've heard, nobody ever really brings up how much this series is about the relationship between Mob and his brother. I heard about gags and the percentage meter and the animation, but I barely ever heard about this, which is really what I think was the core of this season that held it together, not the relationship between Mob and Reagan, which I also heard so much more about. To be fair, that's the one that's focused on in the climax, sure, but it's not the one that had the most development. The craziest thing about the relationship between Mob and Ritsu is that it feels genuine. This is a relationship that you could take out of the show and put into so many other contexts and still have it work. It doesn't need to be about psychic powers in specific since it's really all about wishing we had the strengths of others, which is just highly relatable. I don't know why people don't bring this up as a selling point of the show since it's what really sold me on it besides how great the whole thing looked. 
I don't think I'm going to move on to season two right away. I think I need a little bit of a break first, but I am looking forward to giving it a watch when I feel up to it. I mean, I don't need to rush. I have plenty of time to get caught up before the fall so I can watch season three. Anime finished this year number 18, Sailor Moon Crystal Season 3, 7 out of 10. Prior seasons, 5 out of 10. Yep, took me a little while to get around to finally watching this one, even though I've meant to for a while, despite how much I love the Sailor Moon series. You see, I'm one of those weirdos that actually really likes what Crystal is doing, even if I fully acknowledge that the production values could be lacking in some places of the earlier segment. Because while I do like the 90s anime, I'm someone who read the manga and preferred that because it was more tightly focused. That's not to say the original anime isn't fun though, I mean it's worth watching just for the fashion sense and color palette alone, but I just personally believe that Crystal is able to stand fairly even to it on its own merits. That's especially true of this season where it feels like the show finally hit its stride. The balance of humor and seriousness was more solid, and it felt like it was appropriate for the situation, and they finally did away with those god-awful CGI transformation sequences. Thing is, is while I thought the CGI looked awful in the prior ones just like everyone else, I knew the choreography was solid. So it was more the disappointment of knowing they could have been great and weren't, more than that they just looked bad. However, we have drawn ones now, and a whole lot of them, so all is well with the world. I could see some viewers who don't know what's going on going in being a little put off by the Outer Scouts not wanting to team up and take part in things with the Inner Ones and getting frustrated with this whole loner thing, but I think it's all pretty justified. When your seeming only solution to preventing the end of the world is child murder and you know the other people involved are going to be very anti-child murder, it's likely not a great idea to team up. The villain of this season is one of the weaker ones, but this is made up for by the emotional stakes being cranked up higher than they ever have been before for this series. That's what really works about this season compared to some of the others. The emotion of it just makes sense. I do love the last set of episodes of Crystal for trying to readapt with the manga more in mind and the art style of it, but they ended up feeling pretty hollow. This time around, they seemed to find the heart of the show and really made it work. The shift in art style absolutely helped in this. Some art styles just don't translate well to animation, and the first portion of Crystal was proof of that. To fix it and find this happy medium between the typical anime art style and the beautiful art style of the Sailor Moon manga really helped so much. It makes me hopeful for getting into the Eternal movies and when the Cosmos movies finally release next year. Anime finish this year number 19, Ascendance of a Bookworm season 3. 8 out of 10, prior seasons also 8 out of 10. I am a simple woman. I see Ascendance of a Bookworm. I enjoy myself. I've said before that this is the only isekai series that I've really fallen in love with these days, and that's continued to be true even if this season was a fairly short one. Though I think that was to the show's benefit to not bloat out the last bit of content that they had for the second arc. There were a few things that were cut, but it was nothing that was absolutely vital in my mind, more things that are a nice little bit of extra flavor. That being said, despite the to-be-continued that we were given in the post-credits, I have my doubts that we'll see another season of this one. It's not for lack of story or characters being good anymore, as that was just all as delightful as ever, but the production value was always a little on the cheaper side for this show, and it just got even more so this season. Part of me thinks that this might have been a last-ditch attempt to just keep this one going. Part of the problem is that this wrapped up at the end of the second arc with a nice little bow and the start of the next sees a bit of a big status quo reset. After this point, there's not really a very good place where you could just stop and have that be the end of the show. Everywhere would leave too many unanswered questions and such. I'm already reading the light novels, so this really isn't a problem for me, but I can see how that would be frustrating for someone who is anime only. Still, the season was nice, easy, and breezy watch, and I wish there could be more of it, but I'll accept if that never comes to be. Anime finished this year number 20. The Devil is a Part-Timer, 7 out of 10. So, funny story, I actually started watching this show years ago when it first came out, but only made it to around episode 4 or so. 
I stopped at the time because I was working at a McDonald's as my summer job, so I didn't want to watch a show that even remotely reminded me of work. But with a second season on the horizon and my fast food days long behind me, now seemed like a good time to go back to it. I know this is a series that's quite highly regarded, and I can kind of understand why, but for me, it's just fine. Nothing about this series blows me away or anything like that. The problem that I find is it's trying to be two things at once. On one hand, the series is a comedy, but on the other, it's trying to have this in-depth fantasy plot. It does alright at meshing these, but as someone who was preferring the comedy bits, I could have kind of done without the ongoing plotline, so the middle of the series falls a bit flat for me compared to those first few episodes and the last one of the season. Part of the reason I'm not all that interested in the ongoing plot is how it keeps drawing attention to Mao's prior life, and that just kind of breaks the series if you think about it too much. While I can roll with the guy falling into the conventions of a workplace and seeing it as his path to world domination or whatever, the fact that he's generally a nice guy and actually goes a lot out of his way to help people outside of work, that's really dissonant. Perhaps if they were going for some kind of a reveal that he was never really that bad of a guy back in his old world and everything he did was just misinterpreted to make it seem worse, I could buy it. But the guy does talk a big game about conquering the world all the time, so I doubt it's supposed to be entirely that. I don't know, maybe I'm reading a bit too much into it, but that's the side effect of a comedy show trying to grow a plot. It asks you to take part of it more seriously, and you may end up taking more of it seriously than they actually intended you to. I doubt I would have had this problem if the show had just been a gag sitcom like it seemed like it would be near the start. There's also the issue that it doesn't really have an ending. It just kind of stops. That's not a big deal as much anymore, since we have a second season on the way. But for all those years in between, I don't know if I would have been able to maintain any kind of an interest in this series. Perhaps it's better that I watched it now rather than back then. Anime finish this year number 21, Dance Dance Donsur. 7 out of 10. I'm upset. I really am. You see, I love anime about the arts. It's one of my favorite things for anime to cover. I mean, just look at how much I love Kageki Shoujo to know that I love shows about theater and dance and all that. As such, I was absolutely adoring this show. It was one of my favorites of the season. The art style took some getting used to, but beyond that, the animation was beautiful, it treated the characters with respect, and it visualized the way that a dance can make us feel in really beautiful ways. And then the last two episodes came out. You see, if this was a show that I was sure we were going to get further seasons of, this wouldn't bother me all that much. However, another season isn't guaranteed, and to leave things off here really bothers me. We've got some beautifully developed, complex characters that all have these wonderfully complicated relationships not only with each other, but with the art form that they take part in. I was loving it. Until I saw how those were resolved. Miyako was done so, so dirty. I understand the way that the relationships have been set up in order to create a sort of twisted mirror of Swan Lake. And I think that's really creative. I love that, and I love seeing the way that some people have been breaking it down and finding more and more meaning under the surface. However, I'm personally very frustrated by this idea that Miyako has to stay with Luo just for the sake of his mental health. His mental health is 100% not her responsibility. But we end the season with her at his side and setting aside her own needs. I understand that this isn't the kind of solution that middle schoolers would come up with, but I don't like the way it's being presented here. Granted, this has only covered about a quarter of the manga that's currently out. I'm sure that this is further explored, in fact I've seen a few spoilers that show me that it is, but leaving the show off where we do, it just means the show leaves a bitter taste in my mouth if we never get any more episodes. That being said, the entirety of this show could be emotionally hard to watch at times, but I enjoyed the rest of it quite a bit and do still recommend it. Just be warned that the ending might leave you uncomfortable or unsatisfied. Anime finished this year number 22, The Executioner and Her Way of Life, 8 out of 10. 
This is one where I have to say that the front half was better than the back half, which is always a shame to see. But it seems like that's been a pretty common issue in anime lately, so I guess I can cut it a little slack. There's definitely some hardcore teasing for a second season happening here, and I really hope it gets it, because this was a pretty damn good take on the isekai genre without being some power fantasy, which we need more of these days. The complaints that I do have are all fairly minor when everything else is taken into account. The biggest one is just Momo. There are times when her character gets introspective and serious that make me see glimmers of something I could like, but the rest of the time she's just kind of obnoxious and distracting. She's clearly our designated comic relief character when Akari isn't around to be a cute ditz, and the comedy just doesn't land for me. Those comedy moments are the one place where the series tends to veer into typical isekai trappings, and I'm just not vibing with that. The other complaint that I have is that after a whole season, a lot of our characters are still a little on the flat side. The only ones I have a real interest in are Menno and Akari because they're the ones that have the most going on. I like the princess, but she's a bit one note, and I've already given you my issues with Momo. Perhaps this isn't as bad in the novels, but I haven't read those. A second season would really do this series well to try and flesh out the rest of our cast and make it a bit more round. It's also just a little bit of a shame that our larger overarching plot is really just kicking in at the end of this second arc. But there's no way of knowing exactly where it's going since the novel series is still ongoing. That being said, I still had a lot of fun and would love to see more. The world that they've crafted here is actually fairly interesting. Akari's characterization is actually really fascinating to me because I love a good story about the effects that a time loop can have on the psyche. I'm definitely be willing to watch something that just showed me how ditzy Akari got to be adept Akari. Though, either way, she is unapologetically gay for Menno, and I'm here for it. The two make a great pair. I just want to see more, even if the show wasn't perfect. Anime finished this year number 23, Tomodachi Game. 8 out of 10. At first, I wasn't really sure about the whole concept of doing a death game scenario without any actual risk of death. But then the way the games were pulled off was so well done and with such attention to detail that I couldn't help but enjoy myself. If Tomodachi Game is one thing, then it's a fun ride because it had the ups and downs that I want from this sort of mind game scenario. It starts off simple to get us to understand the characters in the game and then takes off into an absolutely wild ride of non-stop twists that can leave your head spinning if you're not paying attention. I certainly thought they showed their hand too early with who the main villain of the whole situation was going to be, but even that wasn't what it initially seemed. It's a series of constant cliffhangers, and I envy those who are going to get to watch the whole thing in one shot instead of having to wait week to week to see what's going to happen next. About halfway through the season, I couldn't take the cliffhangers any longer and started reading the manga for this one. At that point, it became abundantly clear that we were going to have to get a read-the-manga-for-more ending. To be fair, though, one of the primary purposes of many anime adaptations of something is to get you to buy into that original source material. Though I am hopeful for a second season, as this has gotten a live-action TV miniseries and a few live-action movies, so I think it's already pretty popular in Japan. I can already see that some people are going to be frustrated with where this one left off, and I do not blame them in the slightest, especially since there was some heavy second season teasing. It's yet another cliffhanger, but after reading the manga behind this one, that's just the nature of the beast. This is really the best place that they could have stopped as a sort of turning point for this segment of the series, as it really cuts off the early portion of the series from what follows. The end of the next arc could have been another point like that, but I don't believe that they could have fit everything that's about to happen into the show in the 12 episodes that they have. So, hoping for another season for this one, but if you don't want to wait, the manga is a good read. Though, don't expect any resolution there either. It's still ongoing. Anime finished this year number 24, Healer Girl, 7 out of 10. This one was just as sweet and healing as the title suggests. I'm not someone who is super invested in the Iyashike genre of shows. There are a few standouts that I like, but I don't feel the need to watch every single one of them that comes out. 
However, I think that Healer Girl was really able to stand out and grab my attention by being a musical. I personally wish there were a few more points where it was a musical in the sense that they were singing a song that slotted into what they were doing outside of it being a scene where they're healing with song, as those types became less common the longer the series went on. But even when scenes weren't like that, the music was great and the visuals that went along with the songs were always really pretty and well done. Outside of those scenes of singing, though, the animation could be a little hit and miss at times. There were spots where the faults just really, really stood out, and it was disappointing to see. It's something that I would have loved to see cleaned up, as the inconsistency could get distracting sometimes, taking away from the other wonderful qualities of the series. Personally, though, I really appreciated what the show was going for regarding the healing power of music in both a literal and metaphorical sense. I also appreciated that this was something that was presented as working in tandem with modern medicine rather than being a substitute to it. These girls were to supplement large surgeries, give pain relief, and heal small abrasions. They weren't there to sing away your cancer or anything like that. A responsible take on holistic medicine. We love to see it. I was also glad to see that the show actually tackles things related to singing that are important and show that's a skill that needs to be worked on rather than they just show up and sing. These girls are learning breath support and tone and things like that rather than having some kind of training about turning their healing powers on and off. It's one of those things that gets left out of music anime so much and I was glad to see that side of singing actually get a small nod of acknowledgement at least. Overall, this one was a really sweet slice of healing that can be enjoyed at your own pace. I don't know if we'll get more, but I would be happy to see it. Anime finish this year number 25, Heroines Run the Show, 5 out of 10. So I'm not someone who's big into idol anime or anything like that. For example, I only know so much about Love Live because I was playing the mobile rhythm game, not because I was watching the show. But this one isn't so much an idol anime, I suppose. It's about idols, sure, but it's more about working in the entertainment industry than trying to sell me on this idol group in particular. At least that's the impression that I got off of it. People who are actually into idol shows can feel free to correct me if this is more common in idol media than I thought it was. Either way, this one was a lot of fun. A big part of that comes from the fact that a lot of these characters' relationships are pretty believable. Not that I believe these are real people or anything, but that dial that's labeled anime behavior has been cranked down, if that makes sense. A lot of the way these characters react to situations is much more down-to-earth than I've seen in a lot of other series, which makes the whole thing feel a little more grounded, even if the premise of a high school girl working for a pair of idols who are also in her class is pretty out there from reality. Hiyori herself is really what makes a lot of this series. She's got a great sense of determination that I really love, and she's appreciative of the work that the boys do and the work that goes into their performances, but she's not completely idol crazy either, meaning she can put her head above the crazy most of the time. I also really, really appreciated the show let her have a character design that was not only cute, but also deviated from the typical cute girl mold from an anime. I was really happy that the makeover episode didn't do anything to really change the base of her design, and most importantly, didn't lay a finger on her eyebrows. The biggest issue I have with the show comes down to a lot of the beats of the plotline for the last portion of the series, though I'll try to avoid specific spoilers. I suppose we could call this the scandal arc? So I was really happy when things got into this because I thought we were going to get a nice fat helping of idol fan culture critique. I figured it would ultimately end in forgiveness, and I was right. I know it's a feel-good show, so what else can you expect? But that doesn't mean I have to like it. However, there's a point where they're pointing out that the only one with a reason to do this is a fan and considering how to handle that, and Hiori makes excuses for the fans and basically calls them bad people for distrusting them, which is this bad... The show feels like it's both trying to call out this bad behavior, but also give it a bit of a pass at the same time, which isn't a great mix. It leaves the whole thing feeling really muddled and paints it as a one bad apple situation, when there's even evidence in the show that the online community as a whole is getting pretty nasty over what happens. Frankly, the whole pure fantasy nope dating thing is one of the parts of idol culture that makes me the most uncomfortable, so seeing this happen and just kind of get hand-waved was really frustrating and ended up souring the ending a bit for me. No, actually, I don't have to think about how bad a harasser and stalker feels. There's also the issue that one of the main characters says some real misogynistic stuff, and there's not really any development or addressing of that besides some backstory to explain it. 
Honestly, with some adjustments, this could have been a solid 8 out of 10 for me, but some of the elements here were just really bungled. Anime finish this year number 26, Ya Boy Kong Ming, 8 out of 10. For sure, this one takes home the prize for best opening in the season, if nothing else. I was bopping along every time, and the animation is just delightful. Appropriately, pretty much all the music in this show is great, however, there isn't a very big selection of songs. In fact, when I was being showed that Eiko was performing on a street corner for a decently long stretch of days in a row, they kept using the same song for every situation in that episode. I think alternating between two could have at least brought down that feeling of repetition, because I doubt the girl was literally singing the same song over and over and over again every night. Alright, so this obviously isn't a really solid look at the inside of the music industry. This really falls in line with being one of those non-battle battle anime, where it's very much got the same underlying tropes as a battle show, but with the combat swapped out for something else, and honestly, I love that. As much as I love insider look anime, sometimes something like this is just what you need. I was fine as long as they weren't pulling out any special techniques or something out of nowhere. Although not everything feels like it has the literal stakes of, say, Eiko's career is over if this doesn't work out, there's always something in the emotional stakes that kind of make it feel like that. She was on the verge of quitting when we first met her, so it feels at any moment a big failure could be what she needs to push her to just hang up her hat and move on. However, I do think a hypothetical second season can no longer rely on that since she has reached a certain level of success and we need to start seeing some higher stakes. Overall, I did have a lot of fun, even if I don't know much about Three Kingdoms stuff. I don't really think you need to know that much going in to understand the basics, though, since the show is kind enough to give you a little background whenever it is needed. The one major downside to the series is that there's never really an impression that anything can go wrong. Kong Wing himself is perfectly composed at all times, if a little eccentric for modern standards, and nothing he does ever comes close to failing. Now, part of the appeal is getting into the situations and seeing how he can pull something off. I understand that. But that lack of a sense that he can fail does take away a bit from the engagement and tension of scenes. However, with this being an ongoing and pretty popular series, I suspect that second season might be on the horizon. And given the trajectory of the series, I think that's where that sense of danger might come in more fully. I'll have to do some manga reading to find out for sure, though. Anime finished this year number 27, Fanfare of Adolescence, 4 out of 10. This is one of those shows that I had high hopes for, but the longer it went on, the messier it got, and in the end, I was just watching more out of a sense of obligation because I had already come so far, rather than watching out of a real interest. It's one of those cases where the show isn't outright bad or offensive, it's just messy. Perhaps the biggest issue is that the show didn't know who its main character was. At first, it seemed like it was something shared between you and Shun, but then we threw in Amine out of nowhere, and it seemed like he was almost the third main character. However, there were two or three side characters who got fairly major points of focus, one of which was a character that had been missing from the series for a few episodes. It feels like it was actually an ensemble show, but had a bunch of cut content somewhere along the line. And that feeling of things being cut really comes around when it comes to the last episode, when it puts focus squarely on you and Shun again, but kind of treats them like they had been the focus of the series up to that point, when really, they got about half of the screen time of the show combined, it felt like it doesn't help that this show was going for some serious BL bait with the two of them. If you thought that Princess Carrie with flower petals in the first episode was going to pay off, don't bother, it doesn't aside from a brotherly forehead touch in the last episode to transfer Shun's power to speak with horses, which had always been treated more as a sense of intuition, but apparently is now a literal supernatural power. The animation is a little rough in places, too. Sometimes the horses look alright, and when they're hand-drawn for close-ups, they look great. However, there's plenty of places where the CGI horses and jockeys really stand out and don't look like they're part of the same scene. It's not outright awful, but it's very hit and miss, with more misses than hits. However, there were a few things that I did like. Hayato's arc in specific was something I really appreciated seeing. For some specific jobs and sports like this, if you can do them at all, it's just sometimes out of your control no matter how hard you work. 
I appreciate when shows like this are willing to acknowledge that instead of just going with the narrative that if you work hard, everything will work out. It doesn't always. They also weren't afraid to show the reality of what happens when a horse's leg is badly injured, which was perhaps one of the parts of the later half of the series that hit the hardest. There are aspects to this one that I really did enjoy, but most of it was pretty mediocre at best and fairly sloppily executed. Anime finished this year number 28, Love After World Domination, 5 out of 10. So this is one where I liked it at first, but the longer things went on, the less enthused about the series I was. To start off with, there were times where the show felt pretty cheap. Like, the proportions wouldn't be right on characters when they were right up close, and little things like that can make a series feel rushed. Nowhere did I feel this more than in the climax of the final episode, where we had laser beams and characters floating around without having a real sense of space or what was actually going on. I understand that this is a romance and not an action series, but it had otherwise committed to the Super Sentai bit really well, so this felt a little bit off. Most of my weariness came from the fact that while there were stakes, there were also not. Every time someone would find out the big secret, they ended up being totally chill about it, leading to an impression that either nothing can go wrong or that everyone would actually be more cool with this whole thing than our leads think they would be. Once again, I get it, silly fluffy romance series, but as it's set up for bigger stakes, I don't think it's wrong for me to expect those bigger stakes. I think I just kind of grew bored with this one is all, but by the time I realized that, there were only a few episodes left, so why not finish it out? It's not like it was actively pissing me off or anything, it just became a little bland. That being said, I am growing increasingly frustrated with when a series that trots itself out as being pretty wholesome like this one still feels the need to put in completely unneeded fan service. I said before that I don't think all fan service is bad, but it needs to be a case where it's either the entire damn point of the series and the series knows it, or it has a narrative purpose. In this case, it was neither of those, just fan service thrown in for really no reason, and it wasn't even that subtle either. There was one point where I audibly went, oh, come on, to my screen. I should have seen that coming, though. I don't have a ton of experience with Sentai media, but even a quick Google search of female Super Sentai villain only showed me like one or two costumes that had anywhere near Decimi's exposure. Anime finished this year number 29, Spy Family, 9 out of 10. This is a bit of a hard one to judge since it's not really the end of the season, but only the end of the first half of the season and we're meant to get more later this year. However, with anime like this that gets split into two parts for a season, those two halves often feel very distinct from one another, so I'm going to consider this one complete part and then the other half to be its own part later down the line, okay? If that is the case, then the only real flaw that this has is that it doesn't really end with a bang, it just kind of has a usual episode and then it stops. It also really leaves this loose thread about Anya getting a dog hanging, and I feel that that could have been shifted to a little bit later, perhaps, so we weren't left feeling like we were waiting around on it. Other than that, this show just really hits. I admit that found family is one of my favorite tropes, and this has it in droves. In fact, that's the basis a lot of the comedy is working off of. Each of the characters is pretty well defined and has their own thing going on that keeps them from fading into the background as well. Yor has gotten a bit of the short end of the stick in comparison to the others, though. I'd like to see more of her actually doing her job like we get for Lloyd, instead of just hearing about it when Anya reads her mind. The way things are currently displayed, it just does make her look like she's a housewife. The scenario is kind of ridiculous on its face, but that's what makes it work. It's also just really fun and jazzy and presents the whole thing as so cool. The work really went into this one to give it some of the most stellar animation at times. It's also really good at balancing spy things with family shenanigans with Anya's school adventures. This show feels really well-rounded as a result. I am eagerly looking forward to seeing more and just how we can continue to ramp things up from here. Anime finished this year number 30, The Ancient Magus Bride, 9 out of 10. I love me a good Beauty and the Beast story, and that's what this seemed to be at the outset, but it's actually got so much more going on, and the more we learn about these characters, the more clear it is that this isn't quite a typical Beauty and the Beast tale. 
One of my favorite things here was for sure the music. It was such a tone setter, and while a lot of anime music can sometimes fade into the background, it was always present in this one and complemented the absolutely magical visuals. In particular, the flight scene in episode 12 is completely stellar, and I've watched it independently like five times now. It might be just one of the best uses of theme music to intensify a scene that I have ever seen in anime. The mythology on display here is amazing too. I know some people really like having hard and solid rules for their magic systems, but this is one where we really only know the rules when it matters, and everything else is just flexible, with the flow that really suits the series. There was never really a point where I felt like the magic was able to just solve a problem out of nowhere, and when we got close to a moment like that, the stakes and cost were always really clear. I appreciate that the Fae are indeed Fae. They are otherworldly and don't function on the same rules or morality that we do. And that is what makes Elias so interesting as a character. He is really and truly inhuman. He doesn't understand humans in the slightest, despite being able to communicate and having years upon years to try and do so. He operates differently than humans, and it really does clash when he's put up against Chise sometimes, especially when he starts discovering his own feelings, and that part of discovery brings up things like envy, and he does not know what to do with it. If there is one major complaint that I have, it's that I would have liked that Chisei be at least a few years older. It's not that her age doesn't work, but it would give her a little more of a sense of independence. When her age was stated, I did side-eye that title, but given that it's far less literal than it seems initially, I was able to rest easy. Elias doesn't really have a frame of reference for human customs, so it becomes obvious pretty quickly that his concept of a bride is more akin to a companion or simply woman who lives with me. I admit that there are portions of the relationship between them that are pretty toxic, however, it is a series about growth and coming to understand one another. The fact that there are frequent moments where they actually sit down and talk things over made up for the fact that mistakes were made, even if it's not something that I would personally put up with in reality. This is one where I will be checking out the manga to see more, since if we do ever get another season, it might be a ways off. Anime finished this year number 31. Kaguya-sama Love is War, Ultra Romantic, also known as Season 3, 10 out of 10. For the third season in a row, Kaguya manages to get a perfect score from me. This series just gets better with every season, which doesn't seem possible until it happens each and every time. The series is an absolute treasure, and I am so glad that I managed to get caught up with the prior two seasons in time to watch the third as it came out. Though I did stick to the dub, because the cast is great, but Ian Sinclair's narration is just godlike. The season also left off in just the perfect place. While the sheer popularity of the series does mean that more content is definitely on the way, this is really a point where if something catastrophic happened and that content never was able to come out, this would still be a very satisfying end. So much of what can be said about this series is things that I have already said. The jokes are still there and continue to evolve in the best of ways. Not only is this season the strongest in the comedy aspect of things, but also in the genuinely touching moments and plot that's driving the show beyond just the gags. And as someone who's been reading the manga, it only continues to go up from here in that regard. If you're not watching this one, you really are missing out on one of the best romance comedies in the last few years. Anime finished this year number 32, Day I'm On, 7 out of 10. This was our seasonal slice of life for the spring season, and it was really quite delightful. Enough so that I kind of took it at my own pace instead of watching weekly, which is why I didn't finish it until now. However, I feel that I could have gone even more slowly. The show takes place over the course of an entire year, with the changing of the seasons actually being marked in the show. You could almost watch it at a pace of an episode a month in order to experience the changing of the seasons with these characters. This one is pretty low-key, but all the characters are nice and likable. Yeah, it's a slice of life with decent Iyashi-K vibes throughout it. What more could you expect? It even has some nice information about these traditional sweets, even if the show's not fully about that, it was nice to learn a thing or two, expand my knowledge. 
it wasn't a full deep dive like some other series, but that's clearly not what it was going for. I will say, though, that this is a little on the safe side. It's not doing anything particularly groundbreaking. No, not every series has to, but there were one or two episodes where I found myself growing a little bored. Whenever the love triangle was hinted at especially, as it never went anywhere within these episodes. Thankfully, that didn't come up as often as I feared it would, since more focus was definitely put on the relationship between Nagomo and Itsuka as it should be. It's also a frustrating case where not a whole lot was resolved because it is a slower-paced series and the manga is still ongoing. Even worse, the manga is not translated anywhere that I could find, so I can't continue even if I wanted to. Perhaps my favorite part about this whole series, though, is the art style. It's got this very soft and almost watercolor look to it. It's frankly beautiful, and I would love to see more. Between that and the sound of the opening and ending theme, this series feels frankly nostalgic, like something I would have watched when I was younger and just getting into anime. If you slept on this one last season, it's well worth giving a look now. Anime finished this year number 33, Birdie Wing, Golf Girl's Story, 6 out of 10. Okay, this one was just wild. It wanted to throw everything at the wall and see what would stick. Mobsters, underground golfing rings, lesbians, VR golf, vampires, sudden gentrification, life or death betting. It had it all. At least, at first it did. Early on in the show, I wasn't really sold on this one, but things were just so over the top and wild that I kept watching just to see how it would one-up the craziness that was in the last episode, even if I didn't think the show was actually all that good. I just wanted to see how far it would go. It was kind of dumb and cheesy, but in that way that even if I wouldn't call it good, I was still entertained. However, all that just dropped out of the bottom of the show in episode 9. Suddenly, it was like I was watching an entirely different show about a girls' golf team at an elite school where all of them have the potential to go pro, and the remainder was just so conventional. Like, the cheese factor was still there with everyone being able to pull out some kind of golfing superpower if they were an important enough character, but it paled in comparison to the craziness that was in the first eight episodes. The most interesting thing I could say about the second part is that Eve magically seemed to learn Japanese out of nowhere, and it's never really explained, and that with her as our main character, it felt like we were seeing a golf anime from the perspective of the brash, obsessed rival character for once. But other than that, after everything in the beginning, it just felt boring. The show also ends pretty abruptly right in the middle of kicking into its big tournament arc, but given that a second season has already been confirmed, I suspect that the show was already planned with the fact that there would be one, so they didn't feel the need to tell the complete story in one season. However, if I watch that second season, it's going to heavily depend on which of the two shows that this season feels like season two takes more after wacky mafia mob boss shenanigans or golf at high school.